Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, um, so I should start by saying that I too am not an uh, expert on demons, merely um, a fan. <laughs> um, but what I do think about quite a lot is um, genre and the relationship between genre and ideology. So that is kind of the angle that I'm going to be taking here. So I'm going to be discussing two recent Netflix series, um, Midnight Mass and Diablero, which Diablero is based on the novel El Diablo Me Obligo by F.G. Hagenbeck. So on first sight, the two series are strikingly similar. Each of them takes a priest for a protagonist. In Midnight Mass, we have Monsignor Pruitt, who ministers to a small island community in the modern day USA. And Ramiro Ventura of Diablero is on his way up the ranks as a Catholic priest in Mexico. Both characters have strayed from their vows and have fathered daughters. And each of them encounters the demonic and has his life changed forever. Despite this though, the two characters follow very different narrative trajectories. Um, on a surface level, this can be attributed purely to genre. Um, one surf series is kind of earnestly apocalyptic and the other is playfully inconclusive. However, I'd argue that form and ideology are interconnected here, and that comparing generic features in each text reveals distinct iterations of Catholicism and an earnest engagement with two very different social contexts. The Midnight Mass first released in 2021, Monsignor Pruitt returns from a holy pilgrimage with a blood-sucking winged creature that he believes to be an angel. Pruitt returns calling himself Father Paul and has the appearance of his much younger self because the creature has restored his youth. In wine in the belief that he can offer his congregants eternal life. However, when the blood reaches a critical mass, the immortals find themselves photosensitive, bloodthirsty and prone to murder. The creator of the show, Mike Flanagan, identifies his Catholic upbringing as a catalyst for the story. Of the transubstantiation, he says, the fact that this hasn't been explicitly linked to vampirism surprises me. You're dealing with a mythology that is steeped in blood ritual and resurrection. So here, Flanagan does not acknowledge that much of the symbolism that predominates in Gothic horror text can be traced directly to anxieties about Catholic ritual, particularly the transubstantiation. In the Gothic ideology, religious hysteria and anti-Catholicism in British popular fiction from 1780 to 1880, Diane Long Hoover writes, if the devil assumes initially the shape, the human shape of a monk or abbess, later in the 19th century, he will begin to take the form of a vampire a blood sucker who consumes the life out of a prosperous and healthy Protestant nation and infects it with disease. I would argue that one of the central debates about blood and religion occurs as a response to the Catholic belief that priests have the spiritual power quite literally to turn wine into the blood of Christ during the mass. Investing the priests with what appear to the common folk to be magical powers, it's widely known and condemned by Luther as priest -cross. So Midnight Mass locates itself firmly in the horror genre. Um, it's rife with jump scares, uncanny doubling, and a bloody color palette. And it's so clearly sprung from the genre that the search for older antecedents might appear unnecessary. Techniques to the Catholic Church, Flanagan is revitalizing well-worn ground. In the Gothic, Elena Maria Amandi writes, the nature of social transgressions may differ from one epoch to another, and clinical comprehension of mental disorder changes well. Nevertheless, the Gothic will show a fascination with extreme behavior and derangement of human subjectivity. So although the social transgressions that Flanagan explores are firmly rooted in post 9-11 America, Midnight Mass not only conforms to a cinematic horror tradition, but it taps directly into its Gothic roots by depicting a town's descent into deranged zealotry. 
Shur takes on a lot of aspects of Catholic scripture. Pruitt sanctifies his own violence by citing instances in the Bible of God asking horrible things of his followers. Another character called Riley Flynn discusses the idea of noble suffering and concludes his speech by saying, what a monstrous idea, Father. But although speeches like this are plentiful in the series, the show's major critique focuses on a more general harnessing of divine rights to sanctify or demonize members of society through naming and misnaming. Fatal misnaming of the supposed angel. In which he describes his first encounter with the creature in a crypt outside Jerusalem, Monsignor Pruitt describes a sense of great wings enfolding him. And his mind finally found the word. The word was unearthed by his fear, like the tomb was unearthed by the storm. And the word was angel, and he was so afraid. So Pruitt's leap to the word angel when he discovers this creature is kind of the ultimate in linguistic convenience for him. Um, because if he's been selected by an angel, then everything that he does from that moment can be justified. When he says the word that came to him was angel, he makes himself a kind of passive recipient of revelation, removing any possibility of error on his part and conflating his own internal monologue with the voice of God. Later, Pruitt will re-describe the creature disgustedly as that thing. But by the end of the story, Pruitt realizes that he's been justifying his own desire to bring the woman that he loves back from her degenerative illness. Um, which obviously is a desire much more human than the godly crusade he's been claiming um, by perceiving this being in angelic terms. The dangers implicit in naming also extend to social demonization. Um, so the heroes of the story are a kind of small group of adults who come together to stop the supposed angel from recreating humanity in its own horrific image. And this group is made up of a supposed fallen woman, Mildred Gunner, um, the town's prodigal daughter, Erin Green, the Muslim sheriff, Hassan, and Pruitt's daughter, Sarah, who is also the town's only out lesbian. So just as post-Reformation English Gothic novels juxtapose images of aggressive Catholic brutality with enlightened Protestant values, um, I'd argue that Midnight Mass positions a kind of violent and regressive rendering of Catholicism in opposition to these progressive contemporary protagonists. All four characters are singled out for shaming by the show's antagonist, Bev Keen. Um, Bev Keen initially is a petty tyrant. She is sort of the kind of um, bossy sort of PTA leader of the town. Um, she works for the church and she initially seems to be sort of very annoying, but harmless. We see her taking barely veiled swipes at Hassan um, and at Joe Colley, who struggles with alcoholism. Her cruelty is dressed up in a concern for community, decency and family values, rendering her cartoonishly conservative. Belief in the angel emboldens Bev in her quest to divide the saved from the damned. The words that Bev ultimately levels at Hassan, Viper, and terrorists implicitly align her crusade with the USA's war on terror. Um, and I hope you don't mind me quoting you. Um, okay. <laughs> in discussing demonization in post 9 11 political rhetoric, um, Jonathan O'Donnell writes These dark forces are usually framed as coming from outside or when internal is owing allegiance to that outside. This projection of threatening alterity enables the creation of a phantasmatic image of a walled enclosure, a paradise in its etymological sense, a garden possessed and maintained by sovereign power, the sustaining of which becomes inextricable from articulations of security, sovereignty, and the stability and authenticity of states themselves. So, Bev's ultimate identification of the Muslim character Hassan as a viper in the homogenous paradise of Crockett Island has a political uh, resonance that goes beyond the scriptural. 
Sun, explaining why he left the FBI for Crockett Island, attributes his demotion to similar paranoia and questions about his allegiance. He said the question on everyone's minds at that time was, what if we were interloped? The Bev designates herself the keeper of identity and citizenship on Crockett Island in a microcosm of what has happened nationally. Furthermore, she hopes to loose the supposed angel on the world at large, allowing only the faithful to survive, while the rest are incinerated by the dawn. Joshua Gunn interprets George W. Bush's pre-war speeches as masking the globalization of US ideology as a prophetic imperial righteousness vouchsafed by God. And Bev's crusade follows this formulation very closely. Um, it is both exclusive and expansionist, as she plans to impose her personal taxonomy globally with God as her guarantor. Freud recognizes the dangers of naming and misnaming at the very last. Having urged the townspeople to be sheep among wolves, as in Matthew 10 and 16, he finally comes to his senses as he sees his blood smeared followers shambling towards the church. Look at them, he whispers. We are the wolves. It is now Pruitt's turn to be judged. When he abandons belief in the angel, Bev moves from being his devoted helpmeet to calling him her stumbling block, urging him to get thee behind me. Abruptly and expediently, Pruitt is no longer the mouthpiece of God, but a voice of dissent that must be exorcised. So just as the Gothic novel is a form known for expressing social anxieties, so I think Midnight Mass reflects and critiques the US's tendency to weaponize the language of divine exceptionalism. Although this language is more explicitly evangelical often, Catholicism is an apt choice for Flanagan's generic purposes because its imagery of body and blood is already a staple of Gothic horror. Flanagan's portrayal of Catholicism is both specific um, in its unease with elements of Catholic ritual and metaphoric, as he uses St. Patrick's Church as a stand-in, or as he says, a parable, for a greater culture of Christian mili militarism and exceptionalism in the USA. In true Gothic style, the show uses the angel to represent the repressed horrors of the society that it menaces. As Flanagan states, the creature is notable for its lack of real personality. It's a being of pure id, spreading malignity across existing fault lines. For this reason, we first glimpse it as Pruitt's uncanny double, stalking the shore in his hat and coat. Because it's a manifestation rather than a character proper, there can be no sympathy for the devil here. In order for the story to operate as a cautionary tale, the monster must lack dimension. Diablero, good and evil are rendered with much more complexity, owing to Catholicism's very distinctive history in Mexico, to the point that the horror genre is too facile to contain its multiplicity, and the showrunners take a different approach. In the original novel, El Diablo Me Obligo, Padre Benjamin has his faithlessness and his cynicism validated when he discovers the existence of the demonic. Partly a feature of genre, the novel trades in a plasticky noir aesthetic. It begins with the line, excuse my language, the streets were full of the depressing spectacle of humanity shitting on the planet and continues accordingly, depicting the world as a bleak capitalist hellscape in which demons and angels are bought and sold for profit. Supernatural beings catalyze the plot, which jumps between Afghanistan and LA. However, there's very little complexity or lore attributed to them, a shallowness which owes in part to the dizzying range of demonic references upon which Hagenbeck draws. While the cast of the story is similarly diverse, the novel's social portraits are often equally reductive. A Goodreads review by user Lacqua reads, the disdain of the author for the Chicano, for the Mestizos, for the Mexicans, for the Latinos, for women, they are all whores, evil and self-interested in this book, is there and it is felt. Lacqua, however, declares herself a fan of the Netflix series. 
Unlike the novel, the TV series is deeply rooted in Mexican tradition, and despite its, common over, its comic overtones, it sincerely engages with issues of gender, class, and the survival of indigenous paradigms. In exploring his own country, Padre Ramiro Ventura encounters a world which does not demand a renunciation of his faith, so much as emerging of new beliefs and old, echoing the development of folk Catholicism in Mexico. John M. Ingham writes, Mexican Catholicism continues to impress observers, clerical and anthropological, as a heterodox mixture of indigenous and ecclesiastical elements. William Madsen, a perceptive student of syncretism in the Central Highlands, describes the folk religion of the region as Christo-Paganism. He notes that some saints and conceptions of the soul and hereafter have strong indigenous components. At the same time, he observes the predominance of Catholic forms and suggests that the conversion to Catholicism either eliminated or altered major features of the pre-Hispanic pantheon. When a demon snatches Ramiro's daughter in Diablero, he is forced to, to consort with unlikely allies. Elvis Infante, the Diablero of the title, is pastiche personified. His incantations are a mashup of Latin, Spanish, and Nahuatl. He carries a gun and he traps demons in Coke bottles for resale to an underground fight club. He's helped by his sister Keta, who shares his ancestral powers, and by Nancy, a young woman who can invite demons to inhabit her at will. Nancy is identified with Santa Muerte, the skeletal saint of contemporary folk belief. Duality implicit in her name, which can be translated either as Saint Death or Holy Death. Nancy is similarly multifaceted, volunteering to embody the demonic in order to help save Ramiro's daughter. Ingham states that in the Mexican folk context, an affinity for the demonic or the ability to imitate it is often seen as apotropaic or spiritually protective. In Diablero, sympathetic characters like Nancy must harness these powers to protect the innocent. Here, far from being exceptional, demons are everywhere and are portrayed as elemental and nat natural parts of the world. Elvis explains, look, in this world, there are two types of forces, one good and one really fucking bad. That is to say, angels and demons. Before these two forces were balanced, for every angel, there was a demon, and for every demon, an angel. The problem is that the angels went away. They abandoned us because we behaved badly. But that's why we're here, the Diableros. We take charge of maintaining order. And here in Mexico City, that order hasn't existed in a long time. So while the terms angel and demon superficially suggest a Catholic outlook, the positioning of these beings as interdependent opposites recalls the opposing forces or enamic partners which make up the Aztec life force, Teotl. In the series, demons may be bad forces in the sense of being aggressive towards humans, but the ideal situation is one in which they are counterbalanced and not eliminated. They behave according to their nature, but seldom with active intelligent malevolence. When Ramiro encounters these forces, comedy ensues. Unlike Pruitt, Ramiro is no tr tragic hero. While Flanagan claims to be taking on his own Catholic bringing, upbringing, he does so by depicting Pruitt's downfall, which still gives the religion portentous importance. By contrast, Ramiro is considered quaint, if not cute, in the world of Diablero. The rest of the team nickname him Padrecito, signaling affection and condescension at once. Elvis doesn't deny Ramiro's God, but thinks he might be attributing him with too much importance. Nonetheless, when the group assembles to interrogate a demon, Elvis encourages Ramiro to add his prayers to their incantations, saying, we're going to need all the faith you've got. Ramiro has been operating on partial information all his life, but soon learns that there are more things in heaven and Mexico City than are dreamt of in his philosophy. His journey has a strong class dimension as well. Ramiro's timidity in negotiating the barrio goes hand in hand with his ignorance of the supernatural, painting the church establishment as doubly out of touch with its grassroots iterations. 
that the indigenous knowledge is portrayed as similarly incomplete. Ama Chabala, the Yablera, who's kidnapped Ramiro's daughter, is shown to be deluded when she tries to summon the Aztec god, Tezcatlipoca, by merging four children into a suitable vessel. She's living in isolation, hoping to usher in a new Aztec age, and doesn't realize that she's summoning a level seven demon whose control is beyond her skill. Both Mama Chabala and the Conclave, a sinister network of Catholic priests trying to rid the world of angels and demons alike, are trying to separate out reality, the teeming elemental space that Elvis effortlessly inhabits into different dogmas with disastrous results. Because Mexican syncretism sets ample precedent, precedent for theological commingling, Ramiro's change of heart is far more equivocal than Monsignor Pruitt. Pruitt's last living act is to remove his collar and put his arms around Mildred Gunner, as he should have done long ago. Ramiro removes his collar several times in the course of the series, and he does not leave his religion in any definitive sense. In the season one finale, he and Nancy battle the composite demon together. Nancy by inviting demonic possession and Ramiro by calling upon his guardian angel. Although the characters are ostensibly opposites, sparks literally flying when they hold hands, there is no mistaking their compatibility. So just to wrap up, I would argue that the series' respective portrayals of the demonic portray very different social messages. Um, Midnight Mass's effectiveness of the social crit critique, I think, relies on the portrayal of a monster with very clear figurative significance. Um, and this, of course, dovetails seamlessly with the demands of the horror genre, in which fiendishness must often be very simplistic in order to fulfill its function of provoking fear. The Ablero takes a far less polemical form, but has its own political imperative. Its portrayal of the meeting of good and evil suggests necessary intimacy rather than contagion, and its generic mode incorporates elements of different forms in imitation of this confluence. An earnest message underpins this jaunty syncretic maximalism. Ramiro's journey from narrow-mindedness shows that beneath the umbrella of Catholicism, there exists a complex and ever-changing popular paradigm informed by metaphysics which colonialism has failed to subsume or destroy. 